Welcome to another Soccer Down Here 1v1 Quarantine Edition. And this is round two of the Quarantine Edition with Tony Annan from Atlanta United's Academy. How are you, Tony? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing okay. Uh, We were just kind of digging into it. We're both trying to stay busy right now. And you know, we, we touched on this a little bit last time with you. You don't normally get this kind of time right now do you no never i mean i'm i'm barely i'm barely in the house you know i'm i'm gone it before nine and i'm home probably after eight in the evening so i never get this much time in my house (laughs) so that part maybe isn't the best after a while but it's given you a lot of time to think and you know you get so busy with day-to-day and what this team is doing and what that team is doing and evaluating players and looking at 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 what's coming up on the schedule have you ever had this much time to really truly plan no is the is the truthful answer um like you said i think you know we we go day to day and it's kind of one thing after another and one meeting after another meeting and then dealing with players and dealing with individuals and then dealing with teams, like you said. Um, but, I mean, I've been working on a few documents over the last probably four weeks, five weeks, that uh, I probably should have done a lot earlier in my career and a lot earlier in the process with Atlanta United as well, which is great because now I've been able to deep dive and really, like you said, sit and think and take everything over the last 20 odd years and sort of say, okay, where are we? What do we need to do? And which way are we going? Um, so it's given me a good opportunity to do that. I think a few of the other guys have done the same thing. I set a homework project for the staff to come up with a, a deep dive for themselves, a bit of self-evaluation and where they're going. And some of the projects have been outstanding that they've turned in. So I think it's been it's been strange, but it's also been really good in a way that you stop to think about where you're at and what you've done and what you haven't done and what you should be doing, you know? How hard was it to, to kind of flip your, your switch in your brain to, to go from, you know, constant activity to then everybody, you know, all of a sudden has to figure out, you know, what we're, we're doing, you know, with the, the virus spreading to now actually pushing yourself to, explore new ways of thinking you know how hard was it to make that transition for you um pretty difficult um i think you know me and i'm sure a lot of people know me i I love to work and i love to be busy and i love to be at it you know i'm a soccer junkie as they say i mean i can't live without it it's it's my thing it's been tough not to watch football not not to watch live football that's a huge adjustment um and just not to talk football every day with people that you like, respect, and have a good time with, that's it was difficult. But I think switching gears from active at the fields, in the training ground, you know, banter to sitting in front of a computer doing Zoom calls and creating documents and being a bit more of a, a professor yeah. <laughs> of the game instead of a, an instructor, I guess. Um it's been, it's been, it's been okay. I was a bit, honestly, I was a bit down at first, and then I got into it a little bit, and now I'm in the stage where I'm, I'm getting antsy again. You know, I want to be out, I want to be involved, I want to be busy, mm-hmm. I want to be back day to day in the game, feeling that buzz, loving what I do, obviously. But I'm kind of in stage three, so it was, it was, it's been, it was hard to switch. To a different way of working and I got used to it and now I'm kind of getting to that stage where it's right I'm ready to get out of here and get back to work you know so I can imagine you're, you're getting to the point too that you know as you've kind of dug into some of these new ways of thinking or maybe thinking differently about you know different elements of whether it's coaching or organization you want to actually put it into practice now right yeah absolutely I'm, I'm dying to get back in I mean we've had probably eight Zoom calls, the staff with a respected soccer person from Europe every week. We did one with uh, Fabrizio Del Rosso from Juventus. We did one with uh, Alex Inglethorpe from Liverpool, who's the academy director there. That lasted about two hours. Oh, wow. So we've tried, we've tried to engage with other 
professionals at different levels um, and just pick their brains. So CPDs for the guys has been brilliant, right? It's been great. But there's a lot of little nuggets that have come out of those calls that you think we could do that. It's manageable. Um, and it's a nice way of thinking or doing something. And you think, right, how do we now put that into our process? So those calls have been invaluable, not only to me, but to the staff, I think. But they really enjoyed them. Um, we haven't had one bad call yet, to be honest, where it's been, oh, okay, that was just okay. Everyone's like, those are great. So to be honest, coming out of this, we'll probably work at that continuously. There's a lot of things I think people have discovered in this break, if we call it a break, um, they've discovered different ways of working that may be more efficient and maybe a little bit more enjoyable. Right. Um, that could continue when we come out of this. It's not good saying, all right, we've done that, let's move on. You know, some of these things are kind of cool that we can keep doing and keep educating and keep getting better. Um, and obviously we don't have to fly all over the world to do it, which was the, the usual way of thinking about let's go over to Liverpool, let's go over to Juve, let's go, you know, talk to somebody. Uh, we're talking to uh, assistant manager from Much and Gladbach this week and Stoke City's academy director, Gareth, who's very forward thinking. So those are two, going to be two good calls this week as well. So, Yeah. It's been interesting to see, you know, how you guys have done and, and y'all have put it out there that, you know, not just your staff has been able to benefit from this opportunity to, to talk to some different people, but the players in the academy too. You've had Michael Parkhurst multiple times, but players taking their time at the professional level to talk to the different age groups. How impactful has that been for the kids so far? Huge. It's been brilliant. Jeff. Um, Brooks, Parky, Mark Noble from West Ham, who played 500 games in the Premier League so far in his career. He talked to the guys. Um, we've got a few more lined up for the next week or two that are pretty cool. Um, but it's been great. I mean, the kids have been really engaged. They've been able to pick the brains. But the best thing that's come out of it, every professional player that's talked to the guys has gone into their story of how it's not always great and it's not always going to be good and character's important, training ethic's important. Um, you know, you're going to get knocked down. These things are going to happen. It's not always going to be success, success. So those things, hearing from those guys has been amazing for the staff to hear that, the kids to hear that from very, very good players. But it also... I've been thinking of ways to do the mentor program for the last probably three years. We've been trying different ways of doing it. And then all of a sudden, I know what I'm going to do now because it's been yeah. so easy to have the guys sit down for 30 minutes and talk to groups. So once we get it into smaller groups and position specific, possibly, we think we know how our mentor program is going to go. And hopefully from that comes a lot of good good things that we've been wanting to do for the last couple of years. So. See, that's really interesting to me because it's something we talk about a, a lot on soccer down here. And, I mean, I saw it, you know, as a kid, I didn't have a local player to look up to. You know, we didn't have a professional team from when I started playing, you know, at nine years old until I graduated from high school when the ruckus started in 95. Mm -hmm. But even at that age, for me, like, it was impactful on me playing still to see professional action day to day. And I didn't get a chance to talk to them about their careers and things. Now we have the opportunity and I don't think it's ever truly been, I think organized in the United States to have a true mentor program that coming from, from your culture and your background, maybe a little more second nature. We just haven't had it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the kids in our academy are very fortunate that they get access to our professional players and that our professional players are very open and not too big time mm. to uh, to take the time to speak to our kids. That's a very fortunate position. Even, you know, I grew up in Newcastle and Newcastle United was my team and Peter Beardsley, Paul Gascoigne, those guys I idolised, but I never met them. I never got to sit and talk to them 
I just idolised them from a distance of being in the stands, watching the games and watching training sometimes when they let let you in the training ground. Um, but these guys that we have, they can, I mean, they can feel, touch, speak. I mean, they, they're right there with those guys. And the fact that our pros are willing to sit down and talk and be truthful and be very honest with these kids, you, you just don't get that anyway. And I think that's something we can build on as a aspirational uh, course of action with the, with the academy program and on a whole. So one thing that has happened since we talked last is the development academy from U.S. Soccer has been ended and wasn't really maybe a surprise that it ended in general, but it's ended now in the middle of the season. Were you guys anticipating big changes to it? Did you kind of have a, a sense of what might happen? And, and how far along is that planning for what an academy season looks like now? <laughs> I would like to say we did, but we did not. Right. We didn't know what was coming. There was rumours, there's been rumours for years that it might pack up. and There was rumours on the girls' side that it was possibly going to fold, but not the boys. Mm -hmm. um, it was a complete surprise to us, to be honest. So really we had no planning set for this is going to happen. And then the next day or the day, same day, the MLS comes out and says, right, we're going to own the space and we're going to do something with it. And So we didn't even know that was happening. We're in the MLS. Like we, we are part of the MLS and we didn't know the MLS was going to do it. So, look, I mean, the MLS has to do something for the MLS clubs to, to make it better for us. But it also needs to do something for the country if that's what they feel is their platform and their their space they want to get into. So at the moment, it's all up in the air because no one knows what the leagues are going to look like, which makes planning very difficult. But it also makes planning difficult because we don't even know if we're going to get to travel in the fall. Right. If the travel place stays in ban, uh, sorry, if the travel ban stays in place in the fall, we're going to have to think on our feet about how we're going to all play and how we're going to get games. When do we start training? When is our first comp competitive game? You know, when's our breaks? All the planning we usually do, even just down to the periodization of training, is going to be difficult until we find out what leagues are available to us and what's best for us as a program and as individuals. What what direction do we want to go in? So we're kind of in a holding pattern right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, the day going away kind of, shook things up and I think surprised a lot of people. However, it's a, it's a huge chance now to fix the landscape and try and bring the landscape together without it being exclusive to one group or the other. I think everybody can achieve what they need to achieve and what they need to, uh, to remain competitive. Um, but it's got to have the right obviously the right ideas, the right leadership, and it's got to have the right um, philosophies of what clubs want to do with their players. But there's a huge chance for us to bring it all together and make the landscape a lot better than it's been. Yeah, from the outside looking in, I felt like the, the DA was needed when it started. And this is all on the boy side. I think the, the girl side is a completely different conversation. But you didn't have anything like it when it started but maybe now and and some of this is probably down to mls and other professional clubs coming in with a different approach but maybe it's it's been outgrown by by soccer in the u.s kind of well, what were the good things about the da for you maybe from the beginning and and you know till the end and maybe what are some of the things that you're glad might open up a little bit um look i mean if we go back to the beginning when the day started and the 30 clubs jumped in it and everyone was saying, oh, it won't last, it's just a silly league that's going to fall apart, um, don't go in it, and then all of a sudden everybody wanted to be in it. <clears throat> the day served a purpose. The day was very good for the country. It was very good for production of players. It gave standards. It gave rules. I think the best thing it did, it gave standards to football. It gave standards to soccer clubs 
and said, look, this is the standard of training, the number of training nights. If you don't have them, you can't play. It, it, gave, it gave the game standards, um, which some liked and some didn't. Um, some wanted to operate the way they've always operated, and that's fine. But I think it gave, it, it gave the country a good platform of um, organised elite football. <clears throat> um, it was strict. It was restrictive. It was also a little bit exclusive. So those were the kind of negatives to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the DA, the DA was a very good league. And it, like I said, it was very good for the country at the time. But to your point, federations... Federations don't develop players. Clubs develop players. Whether it's a youth club, a professional club, the clubs are the ones who are, who are responsible for the development of players, not federations. And I think if you go across the world, there's not a federation that's trying to develop its players. It's all down to the clubs and the grassroots. They support the clubs and the grassroots. Um, so, yeah, I think we've hit a point now where You've got MLS academies investing a million to four million dollars per year in a group of 150 players or more. Um, you know that we have a different objective to an elite youth club than we do than they have. They have a college pathway, and you know they produce players, but our objectives are different to theirs. So right. therefore, should there be a league where MLS plays MLS? A lot more. I agree. Yes, they should at certain ages. For development reasons, we need to play the best for the best. And I don't think there's that many elite youth clubs would argue with that. Um, but I don't think it should be exclusive where it's just MLS to MLS only all the time. I think I did a podcast with Nuno uh, and the ECNL guy last week. And I said the same thing to them. I said, listen, we need you. You know, somebody referred to us as the shining star in this city. I turned it around. I went, no, no, no. There's so many shining stars in this city that we need to play and we need to experience games against them as well. So, like I said, there's an opportunity for everyone to get what they need um, to achieve their objectives. It's just it's going to take a lot of ego checking and uh, pulling together. But one thing I can guarantee, Jason, is that Alani United is a city club. It's a community club. And we will always play our city and community clubs, regardless of what platform they're playing in. Whatever status their league is, we don't care. We just want to play. We want to have good games. And we want to make sure our community, our city, is involved with us. Because at the end of the day, we're nothing without the city clubs. Nothing. It's an interesting way of looking at it, and I think at times, you know, as we've had a lot of opportunity on SDH to kind of explore maybe things from the past and talk about it, one thing that, that came up was, you know, the friction that has happened in different markets, I think it's been minimal here, but you see it when a you know professional club, and typically it's MLS, but we're starting to see USL Championship and USL League One teams, you know, create academies as well. The friction with that new, you know, shining star or you know, however you want to put it, comes onto the scene with the existing soccer ecosystem, and that's held the game back in some areas. And you've been really good at, I think, navigating that situation better than than anybody else in Atlanta has in the past, and probably better than a lot have nationwide. You know, what advice would you give to? whether it's Austin, whether it's St. Louis, whether it's you know, Sacramento down the road, when they get into the academy space in mm. navigating those landmines that have come up in other markets? Um, yeah, it's, it's funny you bring those clubs up because each one of those clubs has called me in the last 12 months to ask. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> to ask how we did it or what we did and all that, you know. But um, Be transparent. Be honest. Be upfront, be straightforward, be authentic. That's my advice. Like, obviously, I had relationships in the city for many, many years before I took the job with Atlanta United, which helped me massively to get this thing off the ground without as much conflict as 
if I walked into Sacramento or if I walked into Austin, where I don't know that many people, I think it would still, if I if, if I approached it the same way we approached it here, um, I think it would be okay. But it obviously certainly helped us that we knew who we were dealing with, how they were, what to say, what not to say, at the right time, um, give back as much as we could. Give, we still do give back as much as we can. And look, at the end of the day, you understand not everyone's always going to be happy 100% of the time. You can't make everybody happy all the time. But you certainly do your best and you certainly be honest, transparent, upfront, and be authentic. Just be who you are. You know, don't trend, pretend to be somebody else. I think, honestly, and we've, I've had a lot of conversations with guys in the market over the last two, three years who said, look, when it first started, none of us liked the fact that our best players were going to Atlanta. And, you know, Richard wasn't very diplomatic and he didn't really understand the market either or the USA, for that matter. And I think if Richard had stayed, it would have been a bit bumpier than it was with me taking over from him when he when he left. So it could have been a lot different um, had Richard stayed around because Richard didn't have any time to listen to anybody from the market because he felt like he was the professional club and they were amateurs. That's not how you, that's not a way to look at it, you know? That's the uniqueness of the United States in that, you know, you haven't had the professional clubs with that kind of standing until now. Yeah, and I said to him, look, I've been on that side of the fence as well. You've got to understand where people are coming from. We were trying to be as professional as we could at UFA, Norcross, Georgia United, without the resources. But we still try to be professional as we could, just as clubs do now. Um, You can't say, oh, you're not as good as us because you're not a professional club. I mean, those approaches would have caused us a lot of trouble, I think. But now we're at a point where we are, I think we have great relationships and nobody stands in anybody's way. I think there's one club maybe in Atlanta who stands in kids' way and doesn't encourage them to pursue their dream with Atlanta United. Um, and they, they sell the dream of Europe, which is... That's their thing. And if it works, great. Fair play to them. But that, like I said, I, I can only speak from experience and there's only one club right now that doesn't support what we do and doesn't think we do a good job, I guess. But again, I'm not holding that against them. I'm not being, you know, I'm not, I, I don't give them much thought. I just get on with my job because the rest of the club seem to be very engaged. So the landscape as a whole across the country now, DA gone, you know, clubs are going to be figuring this out, whether it's, you know, a professional club, whether it's a longstanding youth club, whether it's a newer youth club, whether it's a smaller club or a bigger club. I think the the landscape's going to look really different. You know, what is the role in, in your mind of the federation going forward? You know, they're not going to operate a league. They're going to, take a step back at least in the day-to-day development of players but what should their role be and and what are you kind of hoping to see from them um they need to get the national team program in the best shape they can the best staff training centers they should build, in my opinion, they should build training centres. That should be a goal for them where they can do their camps and they can have players in and they can expand on their coaching and their scouting. Um, I think the Federation scouting and coaching needs to get put in a good space. They've got good people. They just need to get it all organised. Um, and then obviously concentrate on doing the best things for the for the national teams to promote the promote the game and promote the U.S.'s brand internationally. Um, uh, coaching education is another one. You know, I think if they focus on coaching education and the national teams and the competition for those national teams and the scouting of the national teams, I think those are the areas that they need to focus on and get it right. 
you know, there's been many different people in and out of that. I think they can get it stabilised and, and try and get that right and not worry about developing players, not worry about the day-to-day development. Leave that to the clubs who are, in their words, very, very capable now of doing it. And now we're at a point where we feel we're capable of developing players, young players. So I think they can get what they need to get right on their end and do a really good job with it, and I think they can. But I think that needs to be their focus. And then the next step down, I think, you know, we've seen it here in Georgia. What is the role going forward of of a state association? Because you have, you know, leagues forming up that clubs are forming on their own. You have national organizations that are not part of the state associations like they used to be. That landscape has changed dramatically in the last few years, and it's probably only going to change more with, with DA going away. Where does the state association fit in? Yeah, I mean, look, there's a place for them as well. Um, clubs have decided to do their own thing based off experience, based off experience, based off things that have happened along the way. Um, and again, that's their own their own prerogative to do that. Um, I'm not judging that at all. But I think the state association still has a major role to play in soccer, in soccer development, in grassroots, in recreational soccer. Um, and you know what? If if they can get their stuff together and get it all in line, they've got a place at the elite youth club table too. There's competitions they could. There's there's competitions. There's tournaments. There's things they could do from a state level that would enhance the game. If it wasn't always about revenue and they thought about soccer without revenue, they could do some really nice things and try and pull again, pull the landscape back together that's so fractured. Right. They have a chance. They have, this is the chance, this is the time where everybody can get together and try and pull it back together for the betterment of the game. Not for someone's bottom line, not for someone's revenue, and not for someone's ego. Right? I mean, th- those are the things that hold everything up. Um, and it's easy for me to say, I guess, I'm sitting here with what I feel is one of the best jobs in the country at what I do. And these are my ideal thoughts that I would love for to happen. But why can't the state association get back into the landscape of things and help pull everything back together? We, we work with them. You know, we, we're happy to work with the state association. And so far they've proven to us that whatever we've done with them has been great. You know, we host ODP for them, um, for the boys' side. So we try to work with our state association, and I think it's important that we do. Just like it's important that we work with our youth clubs, whether our partners, whoever it is. It's just about getting together and sitting down and saying, right, what is it we need? What is it we're willing to do? And what are the non-negotiables? And try and you know pull this thing back together, because right now it's all over the place. Two areas that maybe you haven't had as much direct involvement with in the last few years. You mentioned ODP as one. ODP, you know, has changed so much over the last couple of decades. You know, it was everything, and then it was secondary to DA. Where do you see ODP fitting in going forward? That's a tough question. Um, Does it become a scouting apparatus in some ways? It could. I mean, but, I mean, here's the thing. ODP is serving that player of that level, and it makes that player feel like they've achieved something. It makes that player feel like they're part of something that's a little higher level than what they currently play. And I don't think you should take things like that away from players. Mm-hmm. Just because they're not the elite of the elite and the guys that we're looking at most of the time, I mean, we've, we've pulled one or two from ODP on trail, because we've seen something, but it's not somewhere we would look right now because of its the player pool that's in ODP. But why should that player pool not be awarded for their efforts, for their abilities as ODP? So if ODP is a second-tier elite programming, that's okay. That serves that player really well, so I don't think ODP should go away either. But again... If you start to heal the landscape and you start to pull it together, 
does ODP take a little shift in the right direction? So again, I wouldn't throw it away and say, oh, it's just because it's not elite, elite. But I think those players should have an opportunity to do something higher than their club level of play if they choose to. Because it's not just about the elite of the elite player. It's about right. the whole game. It's about the whole landscape. And that's, that's what I want to get into next is, is an area that you're not involved in directly now, but you have in the past in the recreational game. And you mentioned it with the state association. You know, it, it gets left to the side, I think, a lot in the, the grand scheme of things when we talk about it. But, you know, those are the, the kids that are going to turn into maybe not professional players, maybe not college players, but fans, future coaches, referees, administrators, the lifeblood of the game with DA going away with all the changes in the landscape, what would you like to see done for the recreational player, the recreational program? Well, I mean, every player starts in a recreation program, Jay, right? Everybody. So how can you forget about the recreation program? The problem is in the club world, you know, once they get past 11 or 12 and they're not in the, in the teams, so to speak, um, you know, the, the revenue they get from a recreation player is minimal. So it's, this is not the focus of a club. Um, now, don't get me wrong, some clubs have amazing rec programs and do a really good job with them. But, you know, some it's just a feeder and it's just a, a way of getting kids playing for fun, which there has to be recreation soccer. There has to be. Yeah. But the state, is that's somewhere I think the state can get really involved and really shed a spot, shine a spotlight on the recreation program and invest in recreation programs, because again, your fan base, your admins, everything you said is completely correct. Your fan that goes to watch games, they all played recreation soccer or high school soccer or club soccer. There's not many people who haven't played the game that are going out to watch it. So I think. I think the state, that's somewhere the state can really get involved and really boost clubs' recreation programs to help get more players in the game, get more coaches in the game. What coaching education program is there for recreation coaches in the state? None. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. You know, we, we were trying to do one called Soccer First with the state a few years back. We put this together with Greg where we would have parents – and we would help instruct the parents to make them feel more confident about coaching. Because the biggest thing in the club is we can't get enough coaches to coach the rec teams. Parents don't want to do it. They're scared. Mm -hmm. You know, they're scared of not having the ability or, um, and quite honestly, volunteering at clubs has gone massively down in the last few years as well. Now, whether that's because people know how much revenue is being made in the clubs or whether it's just society as a whole has just decided that they don't have time to volunteer. So that's where the state can help, I think. Coaching, referees, um, grassroots, recreation. That's where the state association should be putting all its chips because those are its members, you know? feels like it's where the, the biggest opportunity for growth is. Um one key element that you just mentioned referees and comes up, whether we're talking about a game at Mercedes Benz, we're talking about a game at, at fifth third bank in Kennesaw with Atlanta United two. I know it comes up with you guys with Academy games. You know, what would you like to see as the level of play has improved so much in, in recent years? The level of coaching has improved so much in recent years, but the level of refereeing maybe hasn't kept up and, I've always kind of thought that it's because resources weren't put to referee development like they are to the other areas of development. That could be right. That could be possible. Um, yeah, Is it just time I, maybe that it needs? It, it needs time, right? Just like the game needed time to catch up and coaches needed to catch up and players are catching up. And I think the referees, it's a thankless job. It's the toughest job especially with some of the people you have to listen to on the sideline <laughs> who couldn't put one foot in front of the other, but they know exactly how to do everything, right? But <laughs> it's, uh, 
that's a challenge for a young kid to be sitting there. And don't get me wrong. I'm not innocent by any means of uh, letting a referee know how I feel. I wasn't going to say anything. In my past careers, uh, <laughs> in my past years. I'm better now than I've ever been, but <clears throat> um, maybe because I'm older and wiser, I hope. <laughs> but it's tough, right, to to stand in the middle of a field and be berated by 40, 50 people sometimes. It's not an easy thing to do, and you couldn't get me to do it. I know that. Um <laughs> But yeah, I mean, look, it's a problem. We don't have enough referees. If Atlanta United's got a great game on a home home game, a lot of the clubs don't have enough referees because the referees all go to watch Atlanta United. So right. it's definitely a problem. And again, is that an area that the state can massively invest in instead of trying to capture the elite youth club market, invest in what needs to be invested in? One area that it's not in the state association. They've kind of felt like it's its own world. It's the, the high school, the college game that, you know, are not part of the federation, not part of the states, but play a really important role. And it's unique to our country um, at the level that it's at. You know, you have school associations in other countries, but here it's such a big part of the fabric. Where do you see the high school game, the college game fitting into the overall picture of soccer in the U.S. going forward? Um, <clears throat> I'll start with college. College game will always be there and will always be needed. Again, um, the society of education in America is still prominent. And yes, there's kids signing professional contracts and foregoing a college education at first, rather to concentrate on a professional career. But, I mean, that's the number of those kids is minute mm -hmm. compared to the whole college game. And, look, I played college in America, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was probably the, some of the best times of my life, and I loved it. <clears throat> and I think that should always be there. Um, yeah, they may not get the very best of the best players anymore because they're signing professional contracts, but that's the game's evolved, and that's what's happened. But there's a huge market still, and there's a huge place for college soccer. And it's a good level. You know, it's not even, if you just look at NCAA 1, NEI is a good level. It's a, uh, Division 3 is better than it's ever been. It's Yeah, doing it's, games with uh, with Oglethorpe and, and what John Aiken's doing over there, I mean, I've been thoroughly impressed by the, the style of soccer that I've seen at D3. Yeah, I mean, it's I've, I've, there's some great players in D3. But to my point, it's, that is the next level of football in the U.S. and it's organized and it's it's invested heavily in and it's it's very good and it shouldn't go anywhere and it shouldn't ever be discounted either. Where oh well, I'm I'm going to go play college soccer instead of professional soccer. Well, that's your level. If you're in Europe and you don't sign for a professional club, you go play non-league, right? Which is probably worse than college soccer. So it's not like it's college soccer's a crappy league of football and it's not good enough, it's great. So I think it should stay. And it should flourish, to be honest. The more player there's better players now that are not signing <clears throat> professional contracts, the less they'll have to go international to get players. And it becomes an American team again, you know? That's a so, really good point. And it's something that I don't think has been talked about enough. I mean, the, the comparison to you know, non-league in other countries and what you get in college, the experience you get. I'm with you. I think it is a, a better opportunity for the players. But I've been pleasantly surprised as I've prepped for, for games with Oglethorpe at the D3 level, how many players from, you know, whether it's Oglethorpe or the opponent, is coming from, you know, South Georgia and has time in Tormenta's Academy or coming from different parts of the country – and spent time in an MLS academy and are now playing at this level. And you see the level now compared to five years ago. It's a night and day. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's better players. There's more of them and teams are getting better. And there's better coaches who are doing better things with the programs. So, yeah, I mean, college soccer is going nowhere and shouldn't go anywhere. Because it is a very good level and you get an education, which is even more important. 
that you get to continue to develop your human side as well as your sports side, you know? And then high school. Yeah, I was about to say, high school is where a lot of people got into, you know, stuff with DA. And it became a huge hot button issue. And I I don't know, where, where, were, where are you on high school and its place going forward? Again, high school is a intricate part of someone's development. Um, as a human and from a social aspect if if we're talking soccer it's not that which most people will say oh you know high school soccer is it's a crap level of play there's it's not that it's not that it's there's there's good coaches in high school soccer there's some good guys doing some good work Um, it's just the mixed bag of players you get in a high school team it's a condensed season. There's some silly rules about not touching a ball for this long and this period of time. and It goes against soccer development a little bit because of the rules surrounding it and the fact that you've got to cram in games two to three games a week. So how do you train? Um, and you know that if you're not training, the development's not being pushed along, you're just training to win games, right? Right. So development kind of gets shoved to the side. So if you're talking about developing a professional player, I agree. He needs to be in an elite environment for 10, 11 months of the year. He can't stop, go play high school soccer and continue that development and then come back to it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. But again, we're talking about the smallest of numbers. We're talking about the smallest of numbers of players who need to do that. So the players in our academy, we feel, need to be with us 10 months of the year, 11 months of the year. And that's what we feel. Whether it's DA or whether it's not, that's how we feel we'll develop players who have a chance to go professionally. But my thing is, that gives somebody else a chance in the high school who may not have made the team a chance to play high school soccer. That's a great point. And again, what does it really matter if you're giving John a chance to play, who probably wouldn't have played if Bill wasn't at Atlanta United or wasn't on an elite level team, you're now giving somebody else a chance to be the guy, to be somebody who is getting developed in a human way, in a social way, who could be a fan for the rest of his life. And that's where I think the arguments all sort of start from right it's we want this player because he's the best player and our team will win if we have that player yeah I, I get that but what are you actually trying to do with your high school soccer team is it about the school is it about spirit is it about including everyone and most high schools will say yes of course then okay then live your core values and give john a chance to play just because john's not as good as bill doesn't mean john shouldn't play so Again, I'm a fan of high school soccer. I think it's great. But I don't think it's great for trying to develop a professional player. That's all. Makes total sense. I mean, the way you describe it with the amount of games, with the the type of training, it it almost sounds like a, a national team kind of situation because you're not recruiting players to a high school unless you're a private school, and that's a whole different conversation. You, yeah. you get the kids you get, and you know you can't really control that so you make the best of it you play a short season it is what it is it's great for those kids but you know it's not the professional proving ground but it's a big part of helping the game grow in this country in the right place absolutely it's a big part of school spirit it's a big part of being being a part of something and look i hate the fact that some of our kids say about high school soccer I don't like saying, no, you can't do that. I'm sorry. It's not. I don't enjoy having those conversations. But if they're serious about being a soccer player for us and trying to make it with us or trying to get to the the best they can be, then they need to train with us in our environment as much as possible. So we can't lose them for four months to a high school environment. So looking forward after we get through all of this and and we start to get back to whatever normal is is defined as you know where's your just level of optimism about the the soccer scene in your world at the 
player development side, you know, all the interaction with leagues now. It's it's going to be a new landscape. You know, where's your your vibe at right now as we get through this? Oh, that's another tough question. <laughs> um, I'm optimistic. I'll say that. I'm say I'll say I think eventually this thing will pass and we will get back to a sense of normality. Um, I'm optimistic about the leagues and the platforms and some things that we're going to do as a club um, that will include everyone, that will try and bring everybody together. Um, I'm optimistic about those things. Obviously, money is going to be out the gates. Things have happened in the last two months that have crippled some companies and obviously damage some families and so we're going to have to deal with all of that so there may be changes to the structure or changes to our budget that we have to adapt to and roll with but at the moment we haven't been told anything other than we're having an academy and it's going to be operational in the same way it's always been so that's positive um, but yeah I'm, I'm not one for dwelling and sitting and doom and gloom and saying well what if this happened what if we have a plan and we've got a couple of different plans ready to roll. Um, we just got to see where this thing comes out. I mean, it's, it could be another month. It could be another two months. and We're going to have to just have a, a good structure and a ready, a, a ready plan to, to roll out and continue doing what we're doing to the best of our ability. Um, other than that, I mean, I can't say that it's going to be back to soccer utopia, which we had, but it could just be uh, a lot of adjustments and a lot of uh, reconfiguring things, that's all. Yeah, I always go back to uh, something that, that Johan Cruyff said about, you know, every disadvantage has an advantage. And, you know, you getting an opportunity to become a professor, not just a, a coach and a director, getting to dig in deeper, and you'll get the chance to implement some of that here soon. And now that you know, there have been changes at the national level on the landscape. You know, while that can be scary, that can also open the doors to new things that, that wouldn't have happened without it. So I'm I'm with you. Like, I'm worried. There's definitely trepidation about how long and you know, when it's going to happen and when what challenges we'll face because there'll be new ones. But I'm also starting to have some optimism about, you know, with this time that people have had, there could be a lot of new ideas that come to the fore, and we could see some real changes in the game and in development as a whole. Yeah, agreed. I think it's been a big reset period for a lot of different people. Um, and hopefully, like I said, a lot of positive things come out of it rather than complaining about it and living in the past, which is something we never want to do. So I'm ready to go. Just Lift the gate and I'm out. <laughs> well, hopefully next time we do one of these, it'll actually be on a pitch and we'll be able to talk about games and training sessions and all the stuff that we love. So, Tony, thank you for the time. I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks again.